It's great to be with you for church today. If we haven't met, my name is Janelle and I have the honor of serving as one of the pastors here. And if this is your first time with us this morning or if you are new to calling this church community home, we are especially glad that you are here and excited to see you jump into our mission, which is to love God, love people and make disciples. There are so many ways that you can be part of that. And this morning, as we have begun a brand new month of the year, we are also beginning a brand new series. Our summer months so far have been spent anchored in Galatians 5 and looking at the fruit of the Spirit. But today we begin busting some myths as part of our new series called Mythbusters. Now, if we had the budget, we would have massive explosions now and experiments happening all over the stage, but bear with me, we will get there. Turn to the person next to you or comment online and say, get ready to bust some myths. Now, whether you have been in church all of your life or you are new to this environment, we all have things that we believe about life, about ourselves, about each other, even about God. And while we can often trace the why behind some of these beliefs back to concrete places like scripture or experience, other things might simply be just what we've always believed, just because, right? Another word for just because is myth. And left unchecked, some of these myths can become facts in our life. And these non-facts then inform our decisions. And these decisions shape not only our lives, but the lives of the people that we love and lead as well. And on and on it goes. For example, how many of you have heard of the five second rule? Give me a wave, the five second rule. If you are not familiar with this, this theory exists that if you drop a piece of food on the ground and you pick it up within five seconds, then there is not enough time for all of the bacteria to jump on it and make that food bad. So if you are particularly clumsy when you eat, like I am, or if you have toddlers who like to throw their food on the ground, this rule saves you a little bit of time at the grocery store, a little bit of money at the grocery store, However, those savings are cancelled out by the amount of times you'll need to go to the doctor because that rule is in fact a myth. Or how about this one? When we think about Genesis and the story of Adam and Eve walking in the garden with God and then eating from a tree that they're forbidden to eat from, we all picture them eating an apple, don't we? And yet nowhere in scripture does it say that it was an apple, that is a myth. It's just a bit of fun when we're talking about myths like these, but the reality is that myths can be connected to big things too. And when a myth becomes the foundation of what you believe, it can become dangerous. It can become dangerous for yourself, for your life, for others. It can become dangerous emotionally, physically, mentally, even spiritually when it starts to affect what we believe about God. In her book, Without Rival, Lisa Bevere says, your concept of God will be reflected in you. Your God perceptions will ultimately be reflected in the life you live and the choices that you make. One of the ways that God is revealed in our lives is by what we call Jesus. If we call Jesus good teacher, he will instruct us. If we call him wise counselor, he will impart wisdom. In the Gospels, we read about a moment where Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And then he asked that question of them too, and Peter responds saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That was Peter's belief, his experience, his conviction. But what about you? What do you call God? How would you describe God? Perhaps when you think of God, you imagine him as being distant and uninvolved. Maybe when it comes to your life, your time, your priorities, your money, God is optional. He's there in case of a crisis, but when it comes to -to day-to-day living, he's not really that necessary. Perhaps your view of God has been that he is angry and just waiting and watching for you to mess up so he can punish you. Or maybe to you, God is close and loving and kind while also pulling strings behind the scenes so that you'll encounter challenges that bring you closer to him. Beloved, none of these are truth. These are all myths. 
And no matter what your description of God might be, Peter was right. And the gospel makes the truth incredibly clear for us. Because the good news of the gospel is that God created humanity, you and I, with the desire that we would live close to Him, in loving relationship with Him, because God is love. But humanity rejected this relationship by treating God's love and God's commands for our life, His guidelines for our life as optional. And in choosing sin, whether it be the non-apple in Genesis or anything on that Galatians 5 list that we are oh so familiar with right now, sexual immorality and impurity, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred and discord, jealousy and rage, selfish ambition, and envy. By all of these things and more, we create distance between us and each other, but more importantly, between us and God. But God's love for us never stops. Aren't you grateful this morning? His pursuit of a whole and holy relationship with us is unending. And the Bible tells us that God sent His only Son, Jesus, to live amongst us here on earth. Jesus drew close to us and took on the punishment of sin for us, dying on a cross, defeating the power of sin and death, being raised to life again so that we might be free to choose Him, to choose life, to choose whole and holy relationship with God once again. As part of the Free Methodist Church, we align with Wesleyan theology, meaning that we believe how we respond in life is a choice. God created us in love with free will. So while God has predestined or predetermined His acts of love towards us, how we respond to those acts is a choice. He doesn't control that. His creative design is that all were created in His image to be in relationship with Him. His divine destiny is that all would have the opportunity to be saved if they so choose. We read this truth in John 3, 16, which says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The myths about God's love sometimes feel endless, but God doesn't love only certain people groups or only certain countries, or only certain political parties. God loved the world so that all may find salvation in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Over five weeks, we will be looking at a number of myths about God, about faith, about sin and healing and humanity, even about happiness, all with the hope of anchoring in God's truth to bust those lies that may have taken root in what we believe and how we live. Which all brings us to our main myth for today, that God is in control of everything. That God is in control of everything. Now, as you hear that statement posed as a myth, I wanna tell you, I completely understand if your initial response is the exact same as mine was. Wait, isn't he? What does that mean? What do I do with this information? How is this a myth? It's a really good question and it's one that I've wrestled with and that today we're gonna unpack together this morning as we look to God's word to guide us into all truth. So if you have your Bibles, would you pull them out and turn to John 11? And as you turn there, I'm gonna invite you to stand to your feet if you're able as a way to honor and revere the word of God. Now, this story is long, so we're gonna do a bit of jumping ahead every now and again, so stick with me, okay? I see you, Tyler. Everyone do a little hop in your place if you can. (laughs) All right, so John chapter 11, starting in verse one, says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he rushed to his side and changed everything. Nope, he stayed where he was for two more days. (laughs) Then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Jumping to verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, 
No, sorry, jumping to verse 17. That was way too far. (laughs) On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Verse 20. When Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know now that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Now jumping to verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. Verse 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Stay standing for a moment and let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are a God who brings life into places and peoples that seem dead. God, in this space right now, we come before you humbly and declare that you are Lord of all. You are king, you are alpha and omega, you are author of every breath that we take. And so we submit to the truth that you wanna reveal to us right now. God, we lay aside all of the things that we have declared as truth and ask that you would fill us with only your truth. God, may it be your words that are heard this morning, not mine. May you bring us transformation more than just information, that we may leave this place looking more like your son, Jesus. We love you, Lord God. We give you all glory in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. 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 Now, as you take your seat, today is National Chocolate Chip Cookie Today, so tell the person next to you your favorite cookie. We've got a lot of cookie lovers in the room. <laughs> One day, the organs of a body gathered together for a meeting to determine who should be in charge. Each one had its own reasons for why it should lead. I should be in charge, said the brain, because I oversee all the body's functions and ensure that everything runs smoothly. Without me, nothing would happen. I should be in charge, said the blood, because I deliver oxygen and nutrients throughout the body, keeping everyone healthy and strong. Without me, the body would waste away. I should be in charge, said the stomach, because I process food and give energy to all the organs. Your energy comes from me. Who's responsible for the cooking in your house? Give me a wave. God bless you. You have a gift I do not have. I should be in charge, said the legs, because I carry the body wherever it wants to go. It's because of me that we can move and explore the world. I should be in charge, said the eyes, because I am able the body to see and navigate through life. Finally, the digestive system spoke up and said, you're all wrong. I should be in charge because I'm responsible for waste management and removal. I'm the one who takes out the trash. Who takes out the trash in your house? God bless you, yes, needed. (laughs) All the organs laughed, insulting the digestive system by not taking its role seriously, and so the digestive system decided to stop working for a few days. (laughs) And it wasn't long before the body began to experience some problems. The brain felt foggy and got terrible headaches. The stomach became bloated and uncomfortable. The legs grew weak and wobbly. The eyes were strained and watery. The blood became imbalanced and toxic, they all realized how crucial the digestive system was and agreed that it was, in fact, in charge. (laughs) Isn't it interesting, though, that when in charge, the digestive system empowered all of the other organs to do their roles well, but when it decided to take control of the situation, things didn't go so well, did they? There is often a 
tension, a fight, a battle that exists for who's in charge and who's in control. If you're a parent, you know it well. If you have siblings, you know it exists. If you are the firstborn, you know we want to be in control and in charge all at the same time, right? <laughs> and as we read this passage about Jesus and a family that he loves deeply, we see so many important things about who God is and also that tension that exists as we live in a temporary world serving an eternal God. We see a God who is with us, but who sees beyond our moment into the future. We see a God who is moved by our grief, but who is not limited to the physicality of our world because He is the resurrection and the life. We see a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-sovereign and reigning overall, and yet hard things, sad things, difficult things still happen. In this story, in your stories, in our stories as humanity, we must recognize that a temptation exists to believe that God is in control of everything and instead align with the truth that God is in charge. We must move away from this notion that God is some kind of puppeteer who is pulling the strings behind the scenes and instead rest in the knowledge that he doesn't need to do that in order to be the one who reigns. And that's your invitation this morning and our main idea for today, that we bust the myth that God is in control of everything when we rest in God's reign. Rest in God's reign. Now Mary and Martha both had questions for Jesus when their brother died, which is understandable. And we get this beautiful glimpse at their responses to him. In verse 27, Martha's words echo Peter's, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. She's declaring his sovereignty, his authority, his reign, even as she grieves her brother. In verse 32, we see that Mary fell at Jesus' feet, which we know is a posture she's been in before because she anointed his feet with oil and her hair. We also read in the Gospels that she sits at his feet and learns. All these times she's showing honour and deference to his authority. Now, I recognise you might be sitting there and this is shaking up your world a little bit, but perhaps this mental shift for you simply comes down to language and understanding that a God who is in control invites us into a dictatorship, but a God who is in charge invites us into relationship. As children, heirs, co-heirs with Christ, as we read in Romans 8, Living alongside a God who is in control would look like being micromanaged, but a God who is in charge imparts wisdom and guidance on how to manage our lives best, whether we turn to the right or the left saying, this is the way, walk in it, as we read in Isaiah 30. A God in control robs us of any sort of autonomy or individuality or unique contribution to his kingdom, but a God in charge gives us all that we need to choose life and godliness like it says in 2 Peter. There's a distinct difference between the two. For example, most of you should know what you plan to do tomorrow, right? You know what your intentions are for Monday, but you can't control every moment of your Monday. You can't control every person you interact with, every car you drive beside, every line you stand in, or the actions of the people in your world. No matter what happens in your day, you remain in charge of the decisions that you will make, but you are not in control of your day. Or how about this? Many of us are familiar with that scripture in Romans 8, which says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. But let me pose this question to you. If God is in control of all things, and if everything that happens in this world is his plan, then why would this promise exist? Why would God need to rework something that he originally intended? Are you grasping the difference here? Yeah. Five of you, great, we'll get there. <laughs> because we live in shakeable ways when we believe in the goodness of God, but then we also believe that God gives us sickness and suffering and struggle to test us or build us up. We live in shakeable ways when our faith is anchored in a God who is love and we declare that to the people around us, but we walk away wondering if atrocities like war or slavery or genocide or abuse are part of his plan. And if 
this myth has the potential to inform things. It definitely has the potential to inform stuff about our faith. For example, what would be the purpose of prayer? What kind of faith would we have when praying for change to the one who is supposedly the cause of the problem? Or on the flip side, praying for strength and endurance while believing that God is going to continue to create problems to prove that he can fix them. Now, the wording is important and not important all at the same time. So please don't leave here feeling legalistic or doomed or, oh no, that song has the word, I trust that God's in control in it and now I can't sing it. Because it's more about the believing than the wording and knowing that as followers of Jesus, we surrender our lives to his reign. So this morning, as we choose to rest, not in God's control, but in God's reign, I have three myth busters for us. Turn to someone and say, three is a holy number. <laughs> myth buster number one happens when we listen instead of limit. When we listen instead of limit. Our finite minds will never fully understand an infinite God. We read him say in Isaiah 55 that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than your thoughts. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 27 tells us that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, the weak things to shame the strong, the lowly things, the despised things, the things that are not to nullify the things that are. If we hold to myths, we miss the fullness of who our God is, of what he can do. This God who creates and heals, this God who frees and restores, this God who breathes life into dry, dead bones and who takes our sin as far away from us as the East is from the West. Eugene Peterson once said that sin shrinks our imagination. How true that is. And yet as followers of Jesus, we have been set free by the power of sin. We are loved by God and he has proven that he is limitless. So instead of limiting to him to our box of understanding, we must listen for what his truth says. Throughout this story in John 11, Jesus is clear on the outcome. The details along the way aren't his to dictate, but over and over again, he declares, Lazarus will live. He rests in the truth of his reign. And if you listen closely, God's desire for life to conquer death hasn't changed, it never will. In 2 Peter 3, we read that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. For this is good and pleases God our Saviour, 1 Timothy 2 reads, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. If your theology means death for someone else, you might be believing a myth. If your theology means that you speak words of death or you pray against someone else, you might be believing a myth because our God is all about life. And as an action step this morning, I want to encourage you to listen before you assign assumptions or limitations. Listen. Don't just listen to anything though. Please God, don't just listen to anything. <laughs> listen to what God says. Listen to his word. Listen in community with his people, which means quite simply, read your Bible, be in church, stay in church community, be part of discipleships, sharpen one another, talk about what God is saying to you, spend time in prayer, Go back to read your Bible again. <laughs> some of it is encouraging, some of it might be challenging, some of it might be confusing or convicting, but there's power in all of it. Here is a specific example for you. I have lots and lots of thoughts about American politics. I wanna say your American politics, because in this one's instance, I wanna be like, the monarchy is wonderful, <laughs> let's stay there. <laughs> but I'm getting there. <laughs> and I think that we all could make some assumptions right now, couldn't we? We all could assign some limitations right now, couldn't we? And yet when I listen to what God says, I hear that I'm supposed to pray for my leaders, submit to my leaders, honor my leaders. It doesn't say anything about 
exposing my leaders, publicly shaming my leaders, causing up a stir against my leaders, fighting with my family member, praying against them. The Bible's clear if you listen for what it's saying. And your beliefs, your convictions, your actions, they're gonna come from somewhere. And if you aren't listening to what God says in his word, or through his people, or as you pray, where will your beliefs come from? And how true can they really be? Our second myth buster for this morning comes from our dear friend, Angela Robinson. She doesn't know I'm gonna say this, but she's amazing. <laughs> We have amazing people that serve on our board, that represent you on our board in decisions that are made. They bring to the table wisdom and discernment and strategy and so much more. And as some of you will remember, we had to make some significant budget cuts this year. For us to break even on the basics, we have a set weekly number that needs to come in every week through tithes and offerings. I know that number off by heart, $13,540. We have seen that happen seven times this year. Seven weeks out of the year, we have hit that number or above, which is amazing and should be cause for panic all at the same time, right? But God has been doing miraculous things behind the scenes and we are still doing okay and believing for sustainable breakthrough when it comes to our church family, jumping in, loving God, loving people, making disciples, through their giving. But all that to say, in a recent board meeting, we were trying to decide whether to implement something that would have been really good financially, but quite honestly, would have been terrible for our church. And when it got to Angela, she quite simply said, if we are trembling, we aren't trusting. And then she dropped the mic and left. No. <laughs> Mythbuster number two happens when we trust instead of tremble. Let's be honest, some of us really like the notion of God being in control of everything. It releases us from responsibility. It puts God in charge of solving all of our problems. It gives us a scapegoat to blame when things go wrong. Or how about this? It gives us a sense of superiority because we must be the elect, the chosen, the set apart. If life is going well for us and everything's going to be okay. But when we look at John 11, we see that Mary and Martha both made the exact same statement to Jesus. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I've had moments like that with God when things have happened. How about you? And yet, as A.J. Swoboda says in his book, The Glorious Dark, one of the dangerous, subtle assumptions that Christians can make about their life is that faith exists to clear disappointments from our schedules. If we hold to myths like these, we'll live as it warns us not to in Ephesians 4, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching. Jesus arrived and Lazarus was dead. And not just dead, but like dead, dead. Dead, buried, four days later, there was a smell. Physiologically, things had been done that could not be undone in this world. But Jesus didn't rush, he didn't panic, he didn't tremble. Instead, he trusted that the circumstances before him didn't change the truth that was within him. He had come to bring life. Amen. As an action step this morning and as a simple way to assess if you are trusting or trembling, I want you to think about something you're wrestling with in life right now. Perhaps it's finances or a relationship. Perhaps it's a decision that you need to make. Perhaps it's a circumstance or something that's happening in someone else's life that you are praying and praying and not seeing change. And ask yourself the question, am I standing firm or am I holding firm? Are you standing firm on what you know about God in spite of this issue or are you holding firm to what it's, you believe it says about you? Are you standing firm on what you believe God can do or holding firm on the ways that you might be able to control the situation? Are you standing firm on the last thing that God told you to do or are you holding firm to what you want him to tell you to do? One is trusting, the other is camouflage for trembling. Turn to someone and say, don't be trembling now. 
As I have Aaron and the worship team join me, our final way to rest in God's reign this morning is Mythbuster number three, which happens when we praise instead of perform. Praise instead of perform. Picture that moment when Jesus arrived at the tomb of Lazarus. Picture that moment when Jesus was born. He could have come sweeping in with force or demanding applause, but he always arrives on the scene with humility, doesn't he? And the first thing we see him do is acknowledge who's still in charge of the situation, which is God. If our belief about God is based on a myth, we'll always be more concerned with doing things right than doing the right things. We'll be more focused on how we are measuring up instead of keeping our eyes up. And from Genesis to Revelation, we see that we've been given the gift of choice, but will we use it for God's glory or for our gain? We can trust that in the good and the bad, God is still sovereign, but will we use that knowledge to wage wars or to promote peace? Second Chronicles says, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. He's not looking for the people who are performing well. He's not looking for those who are the loudest or the most successful or the strongest. And ironically, when we understand that our praise is more important than our performance, our performance actually improves. And God's promises are not passive either, they're participatory. After Jesus prayed, he called out to Lazarus in a loud voice and life emerged from that tomb. But did you notice how Jesus involved the people around him in this miracle? He asked them to roll away the stone in front of the tomb. He asked them to take off the grave clothes. Their actions in and of themselves achieved nothing, but in partnership with the living God, they were part of a praise moment. So for our action step this morning, I want to invite you to stand to your feet one more time if you're able. And together we're going to participate through praise. We praise God for who He is, not for what He does. And yet there's power in your praise to move things on earth because God is still in charge. And don't just limit your praise to this moment either. Find ways to incorporate praise into whatever your daily rhythms might look like this week as a way to rest in God's reign. Let's sing together.